Hunt, editor of Global Government Forum, the publishing events and research business serving civil servants around the world. Welcome to our webinar, The Creative Power of Connectivity, Using Digital Tech to Support Public Health and Economic Growth. The webinar is run in association with Huawei, and you'll hear from Ashley Lumsden, Director of Government and Public Affairs at Huawei UK in a moment, followed by presentations from Andrew Williamson, Vice President of Strategy at Huawei Technologies, and Matthew Howitt, Principal Analyst and Founder of Assembly Research. Before we, research, uh, sorry, before we start, I've got a couple of housekeeping notes. Um, just to let you know, the webinar is being recorded in part so that we can produce an article for publication on Global Government Forum. Um, and uh, we've set aside some time to answer questions at the end. So please do click on the Q&A box at the foot of the Zoom window and type any questions you have in there. I'll keep an eye on it and we'll get through as many as we can at the end. Um, if you have any further questions that aren't answered during the webinar, then Huawei will be happy to answer them and we'll send everyone an email with contact information um, shortly, shortly following the, the webinar in the next few days. That's all from me for now. So over to you, Ashley. Well, thank you very much and uh, good morning, everyone. It's a great pleasure to welcome you to today's webinar. I'm sure it will be a fascinating discussion about how technology can be used to support public health and economic growth in the future. And I'm proud to represent Huawei here uh, as Director of Government and Public Affairs. The coronavirus pandemic has laid bare the dependency we place on our critical national infrastructure. And in particular, how this dependency relates to broadband connectivity, whether fixed line or mobile. Faster broadband connections and smart devices have transformed the way we communicate, purchase services and consume entertainment. And as you'll hear from our speakers today, throughout the pandemic, technology has been used to expand and deliver social and business functions across the globe. With thousands of people now working from home, connectivity has become an even more vital part of everyday life. But the power of technology extends beyond the home. Healthcare and economic sectors are increasingly turning to technology to drive forward innovation for the future. Artificial intelligence, cloud computing, the internet of things, and of course 5G, these new technologies will bring huge changes and benefits to the world in education, environmental sustainability, and many more fields. But what will make all this possible? The answer is simple, connectivity. And connectivity is at the heart of Huawei's contribution. Since we arrived in the UK in 2001, We've worked closely with our partners to deliver essential communications infrastructure across the UK, providing connectivity for homes, businesses and vital public services. We're pleased to have played a critical role in the deployment of the UK's fixed broadband and mobile networks, and we look forward to contributing to the deployment of next generation networks. We're also heavily investing in R&D projects with many of the UK's top universities, uh, including the University of Cambridge, Surrey and Edinburgh, amongst others, and most recently, we announced a five-year partnership with Imperial College, supporting the ongoing work at the Innovation Centre with AI cloud and 5G capabilities. This global pandemic has shown the power of technology and connectivity. Building on this will help shape a brighter future. For the UK to be more resilient going forward and to support its economic recovery, it must establish world-leading infrastructure. While we're proud to be part of that journey, and I look forward to the discussions that we're going to have this morning, and I very much hope you enjoy the event. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ashley. Uh, we'll go over now to the first of our two presentations, uh, this one from Andrew Williamson. Right. Good morning. Greetings from uh, Shenzhen in China. Um, perhaps we could uh, move to the next slide. So what I want to talk about um, quickly uh, this morning uh, is a big topic, but I just wanted to share some lessons and some learnings uh, essentially from East Asia, China in particular, about the way that different um, digital solutions have been used to cope with the pandemic. So we'll talk about the kind of the rules for what's called the new normal um, and then how those digital solutions are being applied uh, for the resumption of daily life. Um, and then I'll talk about some of the, you know, the specific, specific innovative 
applications that are being used in China uh, to essentially help the economy recover. So if we can move on. So this is the kind of the new normal, the diff different rules. I mean, clearly, you know, East Asia, in particular China, Korea, as we know, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Japan, essentially were hit by the pandemic um, earlier than others. Uh, and um, you can say that, you know, for most of those economies now, they're well into this recovery phase. But I think, you know, one of the... Um, one of the fundamental reasons that these countries coped well with the or, or better than most with the pandemic is because a lot of institutional knowledge existed because of the um, the earlier SARS outbreak through 2002 and into 2003. So these kind of rules that exist, um, this kind of resumption back to normality um, is one that's really been based upon, you know, kind of lots of lessons that were learned in the, in the previous pandemic and now. Um, but I think the, the thing that's really very different this time around and, and what's come to the fore is the way that uh, essentially information communication technologies, ICTs, have really come to the aid uh, to this resumption of these kind of these new rules that have been put in place. Um, and we'll talk about these in the next slide. So I think, you know, we've become increasingly familiar to this, but certainly in places like China uh, and, and Korea, um, there was a, a kind of an unleashing of technological uh, applications and solutions. So really, you know, early on in the pandemic, many new uh, innovative ways were being used for digital healthcare, for example. So, you know, you're probably familiar with this, and I'll, I'll talk about this, in, I think, in the next slide, but uh, the, the way that remote diagnosis and training um, was used in hospitals. Actually, you know, a lot of 5G networks were rolled out specifically in Wuhan um, to help uh, cope with, with, with COVID-19. Certainly, there have been early applications of machine learning and, and task-specific AI as well for screening um, and X-ray scanning, and I'll be talking about that. But also, you know, in the use of remote monitoring, obviously, where we had to socially distance in, in hospitals, um, lots of solutions were used for remote monitoring of patients, even using robots in China to help with the kind of disinfecting and cleaning of, of wards. Um, in terms of digital society governance, again, I'll talk about this uh, quickly further on, but this use of QR codes and the general system for, for resumption of production, the use of this green QR code for tracking and tracing individuals throughout China, the use of thermal imagery, has become really you know, prevalent and pervasive now across China in terms of you know, quickly checking. In fact, police officers now have uh, special uh, uh, glasses that can check the, uh, the temperature readings of you know, many people in crowds. Um, and also the use of, of, of carrier networks, loudspeaker systems to inform those that you know, might not have uh, co connectivity through smartphones, et cetera, or, or laptops. I think we're all very familiar around the world in terms of you know, te technology solutions that have been used for digital home life. I think one of the more interesting examples in China has been this use of um, K-12 education. China had already uh, spent a lot of money investing in, in providing um, a best practice platform for K-12 curriculum and education. So the country uh, found it very easy uh, for those that, that for children that were having to, to school at home, even in remote areas, a lot of that was built because of, you know, um, the, the lack of uh, ability to get teachers out to remote areas. Effectively, they were able to use this uh, best practice platform, some of the best teachers in the country teaching the curriculum. So lots of the schools were able to switch quite easily to that um, to that platform. And then finally, this idea of digital responsibility. So the government uh, pumped a lot of money into, you know, alleviating network shortages, increasing capacity in, uh, in, in rural and, and poorer parts of the country. So if we move on, I think this is a you know a, a really great specific example of you know there's lots of talk about artificial intelligence and and you know the potential it has but actually it was really being used um, very early on in in the, in the crisis and and it was stepping up and this kind of you know this this example shows just the um, the increase the acceleration and and the efficiency 
that the kind of you know image recognition um, and 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 machine learning capabilities of, of image recognition was being used in terms of, of scanning um, patients for um, for for the for COVID nineteen um, and just the, you know the increase in productivity. So essentially, uh, now with cloud computing and AI assisted diagnosis, they were able to uh, evaluate and test patients six times faster. Um, than than previously in the kind of you know the manual way of, of doing these types of things. So moving on, I want to talk quickly about this kind of QR code system. So if you're in China, you know you can't really you can't you couldn't enter a public building even even now without this verification of your green QR code. And what that's done is use cloud computing and big data analysis from you know a variety of data sets that are, that are held publicly that just confirm the kind of you know whether or not you had been in quarantine previously um, the people that you had associated with and it was all there to alleviate the kind of you know the manual testing system that would have involved if you're going back to work lots of form filling you know stuff that was done all manually before um, this was greatly alleviated and accelerated by using this QR code. Um, now, of course, there are some issues about you know, data privacy and some of these, uh, these techniques that are being used in China and other countries you know, might, um, more familiar with in Korea and Taiwan, this kind of coding system uh, would be more difficult, but it's a good example, I think, of you know, a way of um, rapidly rolling out. It didn't need so much of the hardware tech. It was all kind of app driven a way of, of tracking and tracing and making sure that people that, that were moving around and entering public buildings and going back to work um, were effectively screened uh, and, and safe to do so. So moving on. Also this kind of application of QR codes has, has also been pervasive. So, you know, essentially, um, you know, living here in China, this was a, a trend that was happening anyway, but it's been greatly accelerated in terms of the move to digital money. So now, you know, cash is essentially dead in China. People are not using notes anymore or coins. Almost every transaction, uh, financial transaction that you do from a you know, tiny shop through to, you know, big supermarkets, whatever you're doing, you're using these QR codes and, and WePay and Alipay. Um, but also, you know, this kind of QR code ecosystem and, and app ecosystem has been rolled out extensively to almost, you know, every facet of life. So there's been a real explosion in terms of the, the, the increase in QR code scanning. Also, you know, in things like um, airports, in terms of, 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 um, of, of talking to people and, and, and acting with individuals, everything is being seamlessly done through QR codes, as is this kind of use of infrared thermometry now in metro systems, in airports and in transport um, hubs um, to, um, you know, check on temperature health of individuals. Next slide, please. Also, you know, I thought this was uh, quite a, an, an amusing comment, if you like this kind of thing, but um, McKinsey did a big report on this kind of digital transformation and the acceleration of the digital transformation. Um, they actually did a big survey of companies and they came up with this, you know, kind of finding that um, who was leading the digital transformation of your company? Was it the CEO? Was it the CTO? Actually, it was COVID-19. Um, and you can see this really happening very rapidly in China. Now, some of those examples is how, are, are how um, essentially online shopping has really come to the fore. I think you know, we're familiar with that as well in, in Europe and other parts of the world, uh, but, but, but Chinese enterprises have really gone for it in a big way early on to help promote uh, Hubei province where Wuhan was you know there was a, a lot of Chinese celebrities came out and helped with a kind of you know uh, there was a reluctance to buy products from from the from the province um, so they generated lots of interest you know and and and, and supported uh, companies and businesses in the province and you know then, then Chinese consumers rallied round uh, and resumed ex uh, consumption because you know the great fear is that people were stopping their spending, were saving lots more, rightly so because of you know the fear of the pandemic. Um, 
Also, there have been where, where 5G has already been rolled out in terms of infrastructure. There is use now of, of VR. If you can't visit a property that you wanted to purchase or, you know, just see what it's like, you can now do that in terms of, you know, virtual reality from your home. In fact, you know, this has become such a, such a big thing now. This kind of online sales executive has been officially uh, sanctioned as a, as, a, as a new job type by the Chinese Bureau of Statistics. Um, it's also being used for hotel promotions. You can go for a test drive all through the kind of novelty of using VR. Um, and also, you know, tourism has been greatly hit around the world. So again, use of VR to kind of visit famous uh, landmarks. Actually, Huawei was involved in putting the world's highest 5G uh, base station and antenna system now on, on Everest. So you can go online and you can uh, see, you know, crystal pin sharp imagery uh, and get a feeling of what it would be like to be at base camp uh, at Everest. So these are all different, you know, different ways that technology is being used to help kind of resume uh, business activities and, and uh, infuse consumers back into um, consumption. Next slide, please. Likewise, you know, the big uh, kind of internet platforms have also been uh, using these kind of uh, online sales promotions using different uh, celebrities but also at a regional level lots of you know uh, city mayors town mayors uh, have come online to promote their cities in a much more effective way you've got a kind of a captured audience at home who aren't going out so much and traveling so this has been an opportunity for them um, to really kind of, you know, push their localities and push local goods because the, the businesses that are obviously suffering the most in, in China and, and other parts of the world are the SMEs, the small to medium sized enterprises. So there's been a big push to help support those. Next slide, please. There's been uh, various, you know, kind of shopping events. So even in Shanghai, you know, there was a great reticence for uh, for, for, for consumers, for people to come out and shop again. Um, so they did this big promotion called Fire 5. It was on the 5th of May, uh, where, you know, they supported big, big discounts in shops. They held nighttime festivals, really, to kind of, you know, infuse um, citizens to come out and consumers. And another kind of, you know, way that technology is being used as well is this idea of digital vouchers. So there's been lots of discussion about you know how governments can support this uh, this economic recovery, um, it can come through kind of kind of direct cash payments. But the problem is a lot of people then save the money because they're they're fearful of of the near future. So supplying these uh, digital vouchers as they have in China for specific types of shops um, can be a really effective way of supporting and target, targeting you know especially small enterprises. So, uh, in this next bit, I want to kind of go back up to the macro level and talk about, you know, um, the value of digital solutions, not just to cope with the pandemic, uh, but also to drive a kind of digital transformation and drive the, the economic recovery that we hope will resume quite soon. Um, and then talk about, you know, quickly some of the examples of, of various countries in the world that are already uh, kind of, you know, um, sold on this idea. So if we go through to the next slide, um, I think we kind of got familiar with an alphabet of different kind of, you know, recoveries. Of course, you know, I am spent many years as an economist. I know how hard it is to forecast the future. But, um, but I think one, one thing that is clear is that, that uh, the government now really um, can help shape the recovery. And that is, a, that is a very different kind of consensus that's appeared now compared to, say, the financial crisis. And I mentioned quotes here from two, you know, very famous eminent economists. Um, but it's a wider consensus now that the government really can help shape that, uh, that the type of recovery that we have. And there's a kind of, an, you know, a, a widespread agreement that the government can really play a big role in that. And if we move on, there's still lots of debate about the best way 
to do it, but the IMF, um, who had been, you know, pretty unsupportive and actually supported kind of austerity after the financial crisis, have now really come out strongly, provided lots of analysis for governments to talk about, you know, the best way that they can um, support the wider economic recovery. And through all their research, they show that, you know, there's various ways that governments can act through consumption, through investment in infrastructure. Uh, through tax cuts or by direct transfers to, um, to to citizens, and actually their research suggests that actually you get the best return, uh, the best fiscal multipliers really do come from investment in infrastructure, and of course you know as we move into the 2020s through this decade, um, there's lots of evidence to suggest in fact that investment into digital inf infrastructure gives the greatest returns uh, on investment for society especially in the medium to long term there's a study that was done by the european commission for example that estimates that the the fiscal multiplier the investment multiplier on 5g infrastructure alone is around 2.5 so you know lots of data and evidence to suggest what what governments could be doing is really investing in digital infrastructure for the economic recovery In fact, some uh, analysis that we've undertaken at Huawei kind of hints that this is embedded anyway. I mean, this this uh, this scatter plot shows um, the change in forecast from the IMF team, from their from their country teams, in terms of you know how much uh, compared to the previous forecast, the new kind of COVID nineteen forecast for twenty twenty one, how much uh, above the previous forecast those countries will grow and it's uh, against the kind of the x-axis which is this measure this global we, we we produce something called the global connectivity index that shows the sophistication uh, uh, already of the digital ecosystem of countries so there's kind of you know there is a a semi-strong uh, correlation that suggests that uh, you know through the economic thinking and forecasts those countries that are already well on the journey to digital transform or digital transformation are those countries that should um, recover much more quickly, hopefully into a V-shaped economic recovery than others. Now, lots of governments in the around the world don't need to be convinced of this. Um, they are aware of the of, of the, the the argument, the compelling argument uh, behind it, and they're already acting. So, you know, certainly through May, you saw a slew of these kind of announcements by governments. Um, about uh, earmarking very large sums of money to uh, digital infrastructure and digital transformation. And one of those is Germany. So Germany announced a very large package just to concentrate on transport infrastructure, but also digital infrastructure of around 31 billion um, US uh, dollars. Um, and a lot of that, you know, 3 billion is going into federal digital infrastructure, uh, partly through uh, 5G um, uh, rollout, but also into cloud computing. Um, and 5 billion of that is uh, earmarked to expanding 5G networks. And with what they have really in mind behind that is that, you know, uh, Germany is pushing very hard on this idea of industry 4.0. Um, so what we call smart manufacturing and they're well on the road for that you know there's various assessments that have been done around the world that they score very highly but interestingly Germany is actually quite uh, behind a number of nations doesn't score that well in terms of its, its existing digital infrastructure so this is an ideal uh, gap that, uh, that the country already has an existing gap that it knows it, it needs to plug um, and help boost that economic recovery for the country. Spain also announced um, a, uh, a, a project to help boost its economic recovery of six billion euros to be to be dispersed immediately uh, with more to come. But really the focus there, the, 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 in, the more interesting focus is this idea of connecting um, rural areas of Spain. So now that we are aware of this kind of, you know, this 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 pandemic. Uh, environment that we live in, how important digital solutions and connectivity are. Uh, the Spanish government are really uh, acting very um, aggressively in terms of closing the digital divide. So a lot of that money that they're putting in in terms of uh, government investment is really there to support the uh, the network operators and others 
um, to help you know make the economic argument uh, and capability and business plans for connecting rural areas that were often left unconnected uh, much more viable. But perhaps, you know, the biggest announcement has been, um, there's been lots of these kind of announcements of a new deal. I think Korea really was the first one to do it, but um, they, they talked, uh, they announced in early May, this idea of a digital new deal to boost their economic recovery. It's a, it's a sum of 20 trillion uh, won, no less. Um, I think that equates to something like 19 billion US dollars. It's the largest fiscal stimulus they've had uh, for many decades and it really concentrates on a kind of you know it's 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 an interesting example because it really looks at uh, they they say taking Korea from being a follower nation to a pace setting digital nation so it's not just in 5g infrastructure that they're investing in the the, the plan is across 10 you know uh, identified pillars but largely concentrating on pushing the nation in terms of support to uh, build out AI ecosystems and also cloud computing, internet of things, uh, smart manufacturing, smart cities. So it's a real big play from them in terms of the economic recovery uh, to digitalizing the entire nation. And then finally, we come to Japan. Japan's plans are very much more specifically about supporting 5G infrastructure roll out they're doing that you know in a variety of ways uh, in, in case you're interested there's lots of information there but it's a you know much of it is through a tax exemption and uh, and and reduction for operators in 5g so it's all about you know accelerating that through um, also a lot of uh, support has been identified for what's called 5g campus network construction so it goes back to this idea of localizing 5G to, you know, essentially manufacturing sites, or it might be universities, uh, really kind of upscaling their capabilities in terms of, you know, exploiting the potential of the Internet of Things. And again, uh, similar to what, what's happening in Spain, uh, Japan has also identified a $800 million subsidy um, to, uh, you know, push and make it uh, economically feasible to roll out uh, 5G infrastructure to sparsely populated areas without signals. So that's it from me. Those are some of the main examples. We've gone through a lot. I hope that's been useful to you all and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew. We'll go over now to Matthew Howitt for the second presentation. Matthew. Great, thanks uh, Mia and good morning everyone. Um, if we could move to the first slide, please. Um, what uh, what I want to talk about is trying to sort of bring it back a little bit to the to the UK and specifically look at the role of connectivity as part of the sort of economic bounce back and the the the, the future sort of economic engine of um, of, of, of Britain. Um, I think it's probably worth saying at this point just a little bit about um, the, you know, the resilience of the of the current broadband infrastructure um, during the pandemic and the fact that it has been uh, incredibly resilient and has stood up particularly well um, and during the time when we needed it most when, you know, we, we as we heard, ended up sort of learning, working and, and, and socialising more from the, uh, the safety of our homes. And um, you know that obviously is is no accident that that infrastructure was was there. We've been talking about improving um, connectivity in Britain for uh, for a long time, um, and in fact, you know I think it, it's fair to say that we are arguably now um, one of the world leaders when it comes to super fast uh, broadband coverage. We've got more than ninety five percent covered uh, of the country already with with super fast speeds. Um, but it's unfortunate that we, we sort of lack um, and lag behind some of the countries that Andrew was just talking about in terms of our, um, our gigabit capable speeds uh, and in particular the, the availability of, um, of full fibre. And um, moving Britain out of this sort of super fast into this uh, ultra fast and, and gigabit capable environment has been something that um, the government and policymakers have been looking at for uh, for a while and certainly before the pandemic 
um, which is why we ended up with this um, very ambitious target set by the Prime Minister um, fairly recently for, uh, for every um, home and business across Britain to have a gigabit capable connection by 2025. And um, you know, that was obviously something that was um, committed to before we, we knew anything about the pandemic and, and the importance that we, can, you know, we place on that, that infrastructure. But I think you know, clearly the, the last few months have brought home just how important that is uh, to, to stick to, uh, despite how challenging that, that time frame in particular is um, in, in order for us to reach. Um, the benefits, obviously, of, of, of the, uh, the ubiquitous connectivity, and in particular, um, gigabit-capable uh, broadband, I think are, are, are well known. Um, they range quite considerably, um, as you might expect. Uh, but some research that we did, uh, which sort of looked to bring together even the most conservative estimates of the industry and government in terms of what um, gigabit broadband can can do for the economy and in particular in terms of productivity improvements show just uh, how big the, these numbers are so on this slide here you can see them going from about 50 billion in 2025 all the way to 68 uh, almost 69 billion by 2030 so we're talking about a, a huge contribution to uh, to the economy um, I think any delay to achieving that very ambitious target risks uh, materially missing out on those productivity benefits and uh, any economists here will know that you know you don't get those um, those productivity improvement back you don't just simply push them down the line they, they end up getting lost so we think that um, even just a couple of years to miss that target um, would mean a, a hit to the uh, to the economy of between 10 and 30 billion pounds so it's a, a very important um, reminder just how important that that connectivity is and how we can make it part of the uh, you know the, the sort of uh, the bounce back that, that everybody so uh, so so hopes for now I think the um, the industry stand ready to support the the government's very ambitious connectivity target and in particular even that 2025 target um, so long as they get the right enablers uh, in, in place. So if we could move to the next slide, please. Um, as part of the, the research that we did a couple of months ago, um, we, we sort of went out there and looked to find out what exactly it was that was sort of holding up um, industry from plowing ahead and putting that investment in place to hit that 2025 target um, for, for full fiber and 5G coverage. Um, and we, we came up with sort of six broad areas that I wanted to talk through, which I think are sort of meaningful in, in the sense of if we get these right, then the industry says it's going to put in the cash uh, and start the digging in order to, uh, to ensure that, that that network of the future is, is there. Um, so these are sort of targeted a little bit at um, government and policymakers, but also um, regulators uh, too. And the first one there is to make sure that we build on that positive progress that we've already made with the with the regulatory environment. So here in the UK, um, Ofcom have been looking at what that regulatory environment looks like for these networks um, for the next sort of five years. And uh, all the indications are so far is that that is sort of heading in the direction that the industry wanted it to see. It sort of strikes that right balance between promoting um, competition and, and ensuring investment. And really, I think what the industry uh, are saying here is that they want to sort of build on that sort of positive progress. You know, consider that this is a very ambitious target, but things are moving in the right direction. Um, and that um, everybody should sort of look to follow the lead that, that Ofcom have done with sort of recognizing the, uh, you know, the challenges that, that are involved here. So that sort of, in some way, turns the spotlight back on to, to government and, and policymakers where, um, you know, Ofcom don't have a role, but where there are still important things that, that need to be done. And I think the industry sort of feel that, um, you know, they've got more or less what they want from, from the regulator, but it's with um, policymakers that uh, ultimately the, um, the responsibility now lies. So that moves us into the, the sort of second um, 
uh, finding from, from the research, which was this idea of maintaining the technolo technology neutral approach to the target. Um, anybody that's been following the, the history of these, um, these connectivity pledges in Britain will know that at one point um, the target was for uh, full fibre um, and then didn't really pay very much attention to, to mobile and 5G in particular. Um, and that, some say, got sort of watered down and got sort of uh, softened by referencing gigabit capable uh, technology. It's not least because um, one provider in particular, Virgin Media's cable footprint, um, if you include that within the fold, it means that you, know, you get a lot closer to being able to hit that 2025 target. Um, we think that actually it's a, it's a positive thing that it was, um, it was sort of broadened to mean more than just full fibre. Um, I think you know, consumers uh, don't particularly care about what that underlying infrastructure is, so long as they can do what they want, need to do with the, with the connection. Uh, and we know that that is going to involve a, a sort of patchwork, uh, depending on the exact um, location of those, those, uh, those, those, those consumers and businesses, uh, but also their needs. And I think it's right to make sure that the, the definition uh, the, the, of, of the technology includes full fibre, it includes cable, and it includes 5G too. So it's important to make sure that it is a, a technology neutral uh, approach. And uh, there have been some um historical sort of leanings i think too much more towards this idea that everything has to be fixed whereas i think you know realistically we need it to to be uh, a, a mix of all of those the uh, the third one there is to um support the the market entry uh, of alternative network operators and i think this has been um particularly um obvious so far around just how important this is to push um, everybody to to invest uh, more and go further with their their footprint and I think this sort of intense competition that we've seen uh, between providers has so far resulted in you know faster speeds for consumers and, and generally lower prices um, and this sort of this sort of rivalry and, and infrastructure led competition has been encouraged by uh, Ofcom and others and you now see you know multiple infrastructure builders competing to build those, those full fiber networks um, so on the large, uh, we think that's a good thing. We think it delivers the benefits that um, that people want it to. Um, but I think we also need to recognise that this model um, isn't going to work for the whole country, particularly where you've got different risk profiles and different economics. You know, certainly there will be areas where you can attract uh, two, three um, providers into the market, but um, we can't expect to replicate that across the whole of the country. Um, where competitive network build doesn't make sense, then you've got to make sure that the, the regulatory environment allows the appropriate recovery of costs for those that, that, that do see a business case for, um, for going there. Uh, and I think we're starting to see an appreciation of that from the, the future regulatory environment as it, as it, um, as, as it looks. But um, it's important to sort of think about what the sort of number of competitors in an area might be. Um, and already, I think we've 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 heard from from Ofcom at the recent um, Culture, Media and Sports Select Committee, uh, where the new incoming um, chief executive of Ofcom has sort of said that you know we don't we're not going to sort of say how many pr providers there should be in the market so long as it's not just one. Um, so maybe it's a slight softening of this um, number of of operators that, uh, that her predecessor. Uh, the previous um, chief executive of Ofcom um, had in mind. So the the fourth one there is um, to ensure that there is um, sufficient government subsidy and funding for, for non-commercial areas where um, you know nobody can sort of see the business case and the economics for for going further with their um, their broadband rollout. And I think um, you know the pandemic is as I said laid bare just how important access to reliable um, future-proof digital infrastructure is you know it's, it's not a luxury but it is very much a, a necessity uh, and I think the industry is you know welcoming of the, the sort of five billion pound commitment that we've had from the government to reach you know the particularly hard hard to reach parts of the country 
uh, and also the government's um, sort of 500 million plus as part of the shared rural network. Um, but overall, I think still those remain modest in sense of the uh, overall expected cost of um, this 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 target. You know, the estimates sort of as much as 30 billion pounds in terms of the cost of getting gigabit connectivity to everyone. Um, so clearly, you know, if if we've only got the five billion on the table, it's important to make the best use of that model, uh, make the best use of that money. Um, and, and some of the things that we found in, in our research was um, other markets, even in Europe, where we've got um, some particularly well-targeted interventions that make use of public's, public money uh, in, in a very sort of good and innovative way. Uh, and these, for example, range uh, from, from various different initiatives, but one in particular was this idea of um, uh, extending this sort of voucher scheme that we've we've had in Britain for a long time, um, but in countries like France, those vouchers can also be used for five G fixed wireless access, for example. So, sort of tying back into that other um, idea that we need to ensure this sort of technology neutrality um, and, and making sure that you know we can get more people connected uh, in in a cost uh, effective way. Um, the fifth one here is 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 around removing um, any remaining barriers to deployment that there might be, and uh, I think this is a, an incredibly uh, important one, one which I think um, government will know very well. Um, and I think we've already again here seen, seen here some encouraging um, progress, uh, particularly around the mandating of full fibre in in new build homes, um, which would certainly help speed up. Um, fiber deployment and, and legislation is already uh, ongoing in this area so that is a is a very encouraging start um, but I think there's still more to do um, and there is there are certain levers I think that um, the policymakers can pull which will certainly help uh, industry quite significantly and, and the, the most obvious one probably is around um, business rates exemption for uh, for these full fiber networks um, you know that has been put in place in England as what in England and Wales, um, but uh, it is for a limited period. It, it could go a lot further. Um, Scotland, for example, has uh, extended that business business rates exemption uh, beyond what is the case in in, in the rest of the country. Um, so I think we need to sort of see uh, a commitment to uh, extending that exemption. Uh, and I do know that there is a sort of wider review of um, of, of the business rates um, system, but uh, this is obviously a, a very big uh, one that could mean that as many as I think three million additional homes could be connected if that uh, business rate exemption was um, was was extended. Um, but there are also other things here um, around planning reforms and obtaining the way leaves, um, everything that makes that commercial deployment a little bit easier. Um, for um, for operators, I think is important for uh, for policymakers to to consider, uh, and tying up um, that uh, that that planning between um, central and, and local government, I think has been particularly frustrating for um, for some in the sector. Um, it doesn't always sort of um, trickle down and translate particularly well. Um, so there's certainly more that needs to be uh, to be fine-tuned in order to, to ensure that we've removed all the possible barriers for the pub, uh, private sector to um, to deploy. The uh, the final one that I wanted to uh, to talk about, and, and one that doesn't really get much um, focus when we talk about broadband and, and in particular improving the availability of, of, of broadband um, and that's around um, the demand side and encouraging uh, more take up because I think there are a lot of people um, even in spite of the last few months that, um, that might consider their current broadband uh, speed to be adequate and that you know they don't see the benefits of of um, of taking a faster speed, even if the the premium is is a, a modest one. In in some cases, I think you know between less than five pounds more, but you can get a connection that is maybe ten times faster. Um, it's about convincing people uh, to to make that switch, and I think um, you know it's important because it it helps the uh, investment case. 
and it, it reduces the risks um, for, for those operators if they know that that, that demand um, is, is there and is a lot more certain. Um, so I think uh, you know, there is a role for government to play um, in this particular area. Um, it's about being a demand aggregator. It's about moving more services online, um, helping those not currently connected um, to see the benefits of, of doing so. Um, and I think playing into a little bit of what Andrew was talking about with, with Germany and, and the idea of industry 4.0, um, I think we need to see more of that in, in the UK. Um, you know, we talk about smart cities and we've been doing so for, for more than a decade, but it's about actually starting to, uh, to, to realize this and, and to, uh, to see uh, and, and take now as an opportunity to, to build those, um, to make sure that you know, the UK can compete in this sort of um, post-Brexit environment with countries like Germany and attract the investment from those big manufacturers. Uh, which I'm sure will be, you know, particularly useful for that economic um, recovery. So those were the, the sort of six um, points that I wanted to uh, to highlight from from the research that we did because I think there's a lot of relevance there to um, to, you know, to what we've been talking about. Um, I'll uh, pause and ask if there are any questions. Thank you very much, both of you, for those presentations. Uh, we now have about. 15 minutes or so for questions. So just a reminder um, for those of you in the audience, if you want to ask any questions, then please type them into the Q&A box at the bottom of the Zoom window. Uh, we have a few in, but I will start with one of mine. Um, and this one's for Andrew. Uh, you presented case studies on um, Germany, Spain, South Korea and Japan. Um, which elements of those strategies do you think will be most powerful in, in growing digital economies? Oh, well, that's a very good question. I think probably the most the most interesting one to to learn from and observe is is Korea's push. I mean, Korea's really talking about you know, as I said, it's the, one of the it's the largest fiscal stimulus they've done. Um, they've had rocky periods in the recent past in terms of their economy, so. It, what was different was just we've we've seen and I you know we've heard about different kind of fiscal programs across different countries, but the Korea one is really about you know transforming the whole nation to become this kind of digital uh, economy leader, and it's the way that they've identified all those kind of what what economists are terming the general purpose technology. So you know five G is underpinning all that kind of communications infrastructure Korea is actually one of the first countries in the in the world to roll out you know full nationwide networks but it's this commitment to then cloud computing uh, big data you know uh, task specific artificial intelligence it's that it's a it's a very kind of widespread not just in the infrastructure but also providing lots of you know government uh, money for research and development and really promoting uh, smart manufacturing, smart cities, it's just, you know, I think it's kind of the ubiquitous nature of, of the push to drive the, the, the economy into, you know, the, the, the 21st century. All right, great, thank you for that. Um, so yes, we got a question in from, uh, from Damien, uh, and this is on the, uh, the topic of QR um, codes and, and phone use in China, so another one for you, Andrew. Um, Certain segments of the population, such as the over 60s and the technology unresponsive, are they also using those instead of cash? Yeah, so so I've been I've been in China now for um, four and a half years, living here, and uh, and I actually had to. What, there's obviously many differences living here and cultural differences, but one of the things I remarked upon quite early on uh, to my wife was how much the elderly generation older generation were using smartphones and their proficiency with smartphones and i think it's a combination of things i think it's you know here given china's you know turbulent history to an extent and the, the economic miracle there's 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 a willingness to embrace technology that i think is perhaps missing a bit in the west with the older generation they just uh, they everything is a marvel to them so they seem to have really kind of embraced and, and engaged with um, smartphones often bought by their 
sons and daughters or, or, or other members of the family. Um, but it's also because you have to use one now in China. You know, there are so many different applications. As I talked about, that was an acceleration of a trend. But um, really, you know, everything now financially is a, is a transaction that uses QR codes, but especially WePay and, and Alipay. So this is something that has just kind of finally killed cash i think and and you know the it's the ease of use there's there's lots that you can read about this tencent which is the company behind WePay and alibaba obviously behind alipay they were very clever about the way that they diffused this technology they, they gave lots of support to even the smallest shop and store you know local store corner shop to get them to understand how to use it the benefits to them and i think there have been wider programs to kind of train and help um, uh, older people become aware of the technology and how to use it so really it's a striking thing but you know we know uh, from our operations in you know over 170 countries in the world it, it, it differs um, and you know as a company a lot of what we try to do is is provide that kind of support to training programs and what's termed digital awareness just making certain kind of gaps uh, this digital divide that exists in lots of countries make those populations just first digitally aware get to understand how the use of kind of smartphone technology and, and apps can really improve their lives mm -hmm. and do you think that the use of qr codes in contactless um, service delivery for example do you think that translates at the moment um, to europe or are we not quite there yet well i'm here you know i still have lots of ties to to the uk and i'm hearing that you know certainly the when the when the pubs reopened and the restaurants and at the weekend, there there is now the ability to order drinks through through apps. Um, presumably, it might be through QR codes. So in China, for example, for at least the last few years, when you go to a restaurant, um, there's a QR code at the table that you sit at, and you you scan that, and it brings up the menu, and you order the food, and then someone brings it to you. So again, you know, it's actually because that was already in place, uh, it's done away with a lot of that kind of you know human to human transaction that was needed before so i can see it becoming you know really quite widely spread it's an existing solution that's actually very uh, helpful and useful now and as i say I it's used everywhere i can anecdotally add actually on my uh, first uh, venture out the, the weekend um i think qr codes have not really ever been particularly popular in the uk you see them printed on things but you rarely see anyone actually wave phone at one um, but but at the weekend now, uh, the, the restaurant I went to, you know, there were no paper menus because obviously they don't want people touching um, the same same bits of paper. So the QR code on the door and you scan it and it brings up the menu. Um, so I think it would be uh, interesting to see if that sticks because you know, certainly people are using it quite enthusiastically. Yeah, sure. All right. Um, and I've got a question for you here, Matthew. Um, you, you mentioned during your presentation the, um, the remaining barriers um, that sort of progress is being made on um, business rate extension and that kind of thing. Um, what are the sort of other remaining barriers to deployment and why is it that they haven't come down yet? Um, that's a good one. I think the, the biggest ones are around um, uh, business rates and, and planning reform, I think. And um, I suspect that it's mostly a problem of needing to involve so many different parts of government in order to uh, get these, you know, changes um, needed that are needed. It's not just simply the, you know, responsibility of the the DCMS. It involves people from so many different parts of, of government, including local government, which has made it a very difficult thing to uh, to coordinate and and to push. Um, but I think, you know, the fact that there is this sort of, um, you know, central uh, uh, target and ambition will help focus everybody in terms of um, working together to, to, to remove them. Um, I think, you know, what's been important is just trying to work out what the priority ones are in order to, um, to, to, to see them fall. And I think the encouraging progress that's been made around mandating a fibre in new build homes has, has encouraged people, I think, that, um, that the others around way leaves and planning and um, business rates are the, are the next to be sort of properly uh, addressed. Yeah, all right. Um, talking about the, um, 
the UK uh, specifically again, you know, how advanced is the UK um, in terms of its digital infrastructure and how do you think it compares with, with other countries? That's maybe a question for both of you. Um, I mean, I, I think I, I referenced the fact that, you know, the UK um, has got a good coverage of, of super fast broadband. Um, more than 95% of the country uh, can, can access a super fast broadband connection now, which um, I think, you know, puts us up there at the top um, of, of, of the lead tables when it comes to super fast. Um, you know, we, we know that we were late with, um, with 4G. You know, there has been this long term belief that the UK is on this sort of low fibre diet and we didn't want it, we didn't need it. But you know, the narrative around that has changed considerably uh, over the last few years. Um, and the competition between providers has pushed people to go much further and, and deeper with, with fibre, which is a good thing. Um, with 5G, I think as well, uh, we were one of the first. We've got probably one of the uh, fastest and, and, and broadest um, 5G networks, not only in Europe, but certainly rivaling uh, other countries um, you know, in, in the world too. Maybe not quite at the same level yet as, uh, as countries like um, Korea, but um, you know, we're certainly not a, a, a laggard when it comes to, to, uh, to 5G. Um, so I think you know we are improving our uh, our, our connectivity story, but um, there is still quite a long way to go, particularly on the fixed side um, mm -hmm. in, in Britain. Um, but you know that 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 target is 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 a huge one, and uh, if you know if we get that environment in place, then you know we uh, we shoot up those those uh, league tables. Yeah. All right. Um, yeah, just to add, I uh, just wanted to add that yes, UK does score very well on these various kind of international measures, including Huawei's Global Connectivity Index. But if you look at the kind of the other ones that are done by a World Economic Forum, etc. But I think the th a thing to to um, to mention and highlight is that you can't rest on your laurels, and especially you know where we're talking about the digital economy, there are many fundamental kind of pieces of the, of the jigsaw that you put, need to put in place and different pillars and the UK has done very well in certain you know London is now recognized as a real leading global hub for for the digital economy but so many countries are now realizing the importance of putting down the foundations for the future digital economy and I gave you some of those examples but there are many others where governments have already earmarked very large sums to building out their infrastructure but also looking at issues like cloud computing, uh, support and research and development, artificial intelligence, et cetera. So the race is really on. And if you start prevaricating and kind of, you know, questioning uh, different types of technology, et cetera, and you fall behind, then you, we really could lose first mover advantage. So I think it's a rapidly changing landscape in terms of, you know, where the different countries are going with the digital economy. Yeah. Yeah, sure. All right. I think we've got time for maybe one or two more questions. Um, what do you hope for um, for the evolution of the UK's digital infrastructure, both in the in the short term and the long term? Um, I'll have a go. Uh, I think it is. Um, it's probably about making sure that um, everybody has access to, um, to to these speeds and and these these upgrades. I think that's um, for me the important thing. Um, you know, the, some of the most vocal people um, when it comes to broadband are those that don't have it or have got a very bad uh, experience. And I think uh, making sure that you know the benefits of this are felt widely is very important um and that no one is sort of left behind you know you don't create this sort of future digital divide i think trying to ensure that is the case is going to be very important and um i think that's why as well the role of, of different technologies are very important in order to uh, to achieve that and prevent you know a divide from from happening and, and mobile in particular obviously um is a is a very uh, more cost effective way and, and a quicker way in, in many cases of getting um those faster speeds to uh particularly hard to reach places you know of which we know britain has got uh, has got many 
and um, I think yeah, a lot of um, MPs post bags are often full of, of people who've got very bad broadband experiences that could probably be helped with a you know four G or a five G connection. Yeah. Have you got an answer for that as well, Andrew? Um, no, I mean I I echo the, those points. Yeah, I think it's kind of it's not just about the the hardware though. It's kind of you know the the software and the human software as well. So, you know, obviously you have to identify. It's not enough to have the the infrastructure in place, although that's very important. So, you know, to identify the the skills gaps. And I was we were talking earlier about digital awareness. Make sure that there are no um, there are gaps in society. There are people that are reluctant or just you know unaware of of the capabilities of, of, of kind of digital solutions. So perhaps the government needs to get a lot more involved uh, and other organisations, civil society, in terms of improving that kind of capability through society as well. Yeah. All right, great. I think we're, uh, we're out of time. So thank you very much, uh, Ashley, to Andrew, uh, to Farway, to Matthew, um, and particularly to you, the audience. We really hope that you found this webinar useful. Um, there are a few questions there that we didn't get through, so just a reminder that we'll send through some uh, contact details by email um, in the next few days, um, so you can ask, uh, ask questions then. Um, and you'll also get uh, a link to the slides, uh, the recording and the write-up. Um, so yeah, in the meantime, thank you to um, all of the civil servants watching um, for all that you're doing to support citizens and to deliver public services in the midst of, of the coronavirus crisis. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.